TARDIS is playing up today. <laughs> it's slightly, slightly late. Landed on some other planet somewhere. Had to take a detour. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, it's great to see you all back again. I think I lost half of you, but we found, we found 50 more percent to come back. So, so uh, yeah. Um, great. Where do we start today? Um, I a few notes, but um, uh, let's just see. I'm kind of hoping you've all done a bit of swimming and, and you've been in a, in a uh, swimming pool and with diving boards. Most of you here probably can ha happily jump in off a one meter board. You all done that? One meter board? Yeah. yeah, okay. Have you all tried going up higher to a two meter board? Three meter board? It's quite high up there. Who's jumped off a five meter board? Cool. Cool. Dived as well. Now, you know the Olympic high diving boards, 10 meters. Anyone jumped off that? Well done. Well, what we're basically, with this analogy, is, is uh, the beginnings of looking at what it's like to be standing on top of a 10 meter board. Because that's where we're going to be standing in a few years time. And we've got to jump. And the sort of things that we've got to overcome at that point is quite a bit of fear of jumping and going into a pool of water 10 meters. And that's, we have to do it. No one else is going to do it for us. But by taking you up from one meter to three meters and up to five meters, slowly, one, one stage at a time, for those of you who have done 10 meter jumps, then it's... Uh, it's a little bit easier if you take it in stages. I'm, I'm so glad it worked today, this analogy, because I have a discussion group online, uh, and I did this with them when we, when we were talking about it, and uh, there's one lady from, t from Ottawa in, in Canada. She says, yes, no problem. She says, I said, how come? She said, I was a Canadian high diving champion, she said. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, she's in her late 50s, and goodness gracious, that's... Uh, completely didn't work for jumping there but I want to take it one stage further because that high diving platform is is a fear thing you don't have to do too much you just got to jump off it's not easy I, I personally haven't jumped off a 10 meter board and I'm not quite sure I'm ready for it myself but I want to add a bit more complexity to it to make it slightly more realistic anyone tried any surfing bodybuilding, bodybuilding yeah yeah. Proper surfing? Good. <laughs> What's the, the, if, you, if you were out there today, you'd probably imagine these waves. And a nice, you know, three feet high wave is, ni is a nice enough to start off, isn't it? You get pushed into the shore. Okay. You start looking at going to a 10 feet wave. Anyone been out surfing in 10 foot waves? Yeah? Cool. Yeah? It's a bit trickier. You've got to learn how to hold your breath for quite a while because if you get turned over the falls there, you're under the water for probably about a minute if you're not careful. And the top surfers these days, they have huge belts on them. They carry oxygen in, in, in things they can put in their mouth and they could be under for two or three minutes. But the surfing analogy is slightly different from the high diving boards because you've got to learn to catch the wave right. And the thing about that is, if you actually are paddling to catch a wave, you can do it the wrong way by paddling too soon, and then you, don't, you miss the wave. Paddling too late, and you miss the wave. But if you just get it right, and you're going with the same sort of speed of the wave at the right time, you jump up onto your board, and you can surf the wave in. One of the problems they had with surfing 100 foot waves, 80, 90 foot waves, was the speed of paddling was becoming too difficult. So they used to get, they'd get tow-in people, they're, they're being pulled behind these jet skis 
to get the speed up so they can catch these bigger waves. Well, why the wave analogy? Well, we are in the process of moving, as I said yesterday, into this galactic current sheet. The solar system does this regularly. Uh, I, I mentioned last time is roughly every 12,000 years our solar system goes through this current sheet. It's that big rippling thing which, we, which goes around the, the current, the, 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 our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And this is coming towards us. And as something is, as big and dynamic as this, it, it has waves which are called bow waves ahead of it. Just like uh, these big oil tankers, you can see these uh, dolphins playing on the bow waves in front of boats. It's, it's, a, it's a wave which goes ahead of the wave, ahead of the ship. We're experiencing the sort of buffeting right now because we're going through this transition zone before we hit the big wave. And the waves in this buffet zone are getting larger and larger and larger. And we're experiencing that. This is that moment in time where you probably all think, oh my goodness, what's hitting me today? Or for this week, it's been a really tough week energetically. This is the advancing current sheet that we're going through. And the waves are going to get bigger. But the good news is, thankfully, <laughs> the jumps between the one meter board don't go from one meter to 10 meter. We can go up to a two meter board and experience a slightly more powerful wave and then a three meter board. And once we're used to a three meter board, well, you can jump off that all day until you get another one coming along, which is maybe a five meter board. And it's the same with these waves. The bigger ones are coming and we have to be prepared for that. So uh, uh, to talk today is a little bit about preparing uh, for these waves what's going to happen, uh, what the prophecies say are going to happen, uh, what we must do uh, to learn to surf a 30-foot wave. Okay, I haven't surfed a 30-foot wave, but I know I have good friends of mine who have actually do big wave surfing, and um, they built up as well. They had to build it up. So we can do this. Uh, and also we'll take a look, a look at what the deceivers are probably going to try and do to stop us. And we've got to view these deceivers, uh, the people with the mind virus, the people who are uh, playing devil's advocate right now, who are putting everything in our way to stop us. We've got to, we've got to re reframe that whole thing. It's because they're actually helping us. By putting us under pressure, it's part of our learning to cope with not having fear. So when we stand on the 10 meter board, hey, that's easy. I'm just not gonna do the double somersault. <laughs> I, I just, that feet first is enough for us, okay? So, so we're gonna look at perhaps what they're gonna do and how we can, we can reframe that. Um, so that, that's where we're heading today. Um, we're probably, uh, the last time we looked at the the earth energy lines and how they were changing and the observations we we're making on that and how we need to keep making changes on that because it's a very new science we've got to look at what's going on there um, and getting on to these energy sites which is where we're going to learn with our group meditations and things like that that's a, that's an aspect we've got to, to, to do more on and we covered that a bit yesterday we talked also about the the conscious mind and the subconscious mind and the importance of, of shifting between one and the other and how we've got to have the intensity of, of focus and the intensity of awareness in our understandings and our communications. And communication is going to be a big thing we have to prepare for going forward, and I'll cover that a bit in a moment. But <coughs> one of the, the fundamental things I have a problem with science at the moment, and, and being a, a, a geologist, geobiologist, it's, it's really important to, to recognize that right now, there is no aspect in science that allows for the concept of universal intelligence. There's nothing in science which tries to explain this. There's nothing in science which even attempts to explain survival after death. The mind living on pretty much immediately after physical bodily death. Um, I'm not going to go into that subject today uh, too much, but for the fact for saying is, where we stand here 
is if you have a paradigm mind shift and say, actually, we have a science that explains how intelligence behind the universe must have arisen to gone on to create matter in these illusory matter worlds, and, and it must explain survival after death. Those are the, the, the basic assumptions for the new science, which fortunately, if you're not aware of it, has been done and dusted. It's taken one man, Ron Pearson, 24 years to put it all together. So that has no flaws. It fits with quantum theory. He never intended to start, start out by explaining how intelligence arose behind the universe. He just tried to explain to the other scientists why the Big Bang was full of flaws, how it couldn't possibly have happened from an engineering perspective. The guy was a genius. The unfortunate thing was his explanations for a better theory <laughs> arose this concept of intelligence and then science community just shut him off. So why am I going on about this? Because one of the things we've got to do to prepare is a bit strange. We've got to become prophets. Now prophecy, if you, if you think of psychologists or if you think of anybody in science, they're going to really throw you in the nut house if you start going on about prophecy. It's just not possible under their rules of science. And they are putting the rules of science in specifically to stop us looking at aspects of the true nature of reality that is going to actually benefit us because of what's coming. Prepare us for that 30 foot wave. So I need to start with prophecy because I'm going to mention some prophecies today. And, and, and I need you to realize, OK, there is a science behind this that makes sense. So, I divide prophecies up into two types, long-term prophecies and short-term prophecies. Short-term prophecies are all down to probability. But it only works if you consider that our mind is connected in some way to the universal mind, the universal intelligence. It can connect to the minds of the people on the other worlds. So when we have our mediumship and our connection between moving from focus to awareness, the conscious mind to the subconscious mind, we're opening up a, a form of communication with some other being that has a fragment of the universal mind, just like all beings have fragments of the universal mind, just like our mind is part of this universal mind, and that's how we're all interconnected. As soon as you start recognizing that if you put yourselves in the mind of, of, of God, if you like, this universal consciousness, it knows what's being thought, what's being experienced in every bit of its fragments of mind, all around the universe on all the different matter frequency systems. In our world, the, and I do believe these different matter frequency worlds, uh, Seth talks about in, 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 in um, The True Nature of Reality, and Seth speaks by, by Jane Roberts. Seth is this character that she was channeling, and he's talking about these different camouflage systems. And they are different systems for housing fragments of the mind so that the fragments of the mind can experience different environments. We have a unique environment here. I don't see this as a hierarchy of getting up necessarily to a better environment. This is an environment which is for us to experience the ego, the individual consciousness, which is really important, and a particular concept of time. And time here is not like on other worlds. It's somehow it's slowed down to give us that chance of experiencing things in a, in a very, very slow way, which gives us that impression that we can actually really get to grips with what's going on here. So things like science, discovering the truth, making observations in this environment can be massively beneficial because it can't be done in any other environment. All the other matter frequency worlds have other challenges for minds to progress to and to work with. So we're in this system where every one of us can contribute through the work that we do because of one, one potential reason. And if you ask well, what our reason is for, gro for, for life, and it's about growing, learning, and developing. Well, the universal consciousness itself has a motivation. It needs to grow. It needs to learn and develop. And the way it's doing it is through fragmenting its mind into beings and creating these illusory worlds for us to experience. Now put yourself in the, in, in, in the universal consciousness position 
it can tell everyone in our minds here what we're thinking of doing. And if we're thinking of doing something tomorrow, we've got it in our diary and we're pretty much sure we're going to do it, then the universal mind could essentially predict what you're going to do tomorrow. Because there's a very good probability of you going to do that tomorrow. If you then put a, a thing in your diary which is like a year's time, I think I'm going to go to fly to Hawaii. Yeah, right, well, we've got to win some money first, you know. <laughs> but the universal consciousness is thinking, the probability is not as good as that. <laughs> you, know? you know, that's maybe a, a year or two ahead. So the probability of me flying to Hawaii in, in, in a year's time is a lot less. So you can begin to see if you've got something that can read minds, like a universal consciousness, there is a predictability in the short term. If you amplify that now with hundreds of thousands of people thinking the same thing and they're going to do something tomorrow together, the probability of that happening tomorrow is pretty high. And the universal consciousness will be able to predict, yep, this is going to happen tomorrow. So if you were tapping into the universal mind, you have this ability to tap into the probability that exists for these outcomes that happen tomorrow, the next day, the next week. And so this short-term predictability is based on probability, based on the fact that the universal mind and all our minds can be interconnected. This is why the likes of that dream detective I mentioned yesterday, Chris Robinson, who actually uh, has over a thousand preset symbols which he pre-programmed in his mind so that when he s slept and he dreamt of those symbols he knew his subconscious mind was giving him very relevant specific information. So when he dreamt of a dog he knew it was a terrorist. When he dreamt of a blizzard he knew it was bombs. So when he went to, dreamt of togs and blizzards in a Cheltenham hotel many many years ago he rang up the police and said, there's some bombers who have got bomb-making equipment in a Cheltenham hotel. This is the time when the Irish bombs were in London. Strange times, I remember running past dustbins when I was a kid in London because of the scares, Corey, the scare stories about the dustbins were where Irish bombers were putting in. It just doesn't, doesn't change today with the rubbish, isn't it? But, um, of course, they immediately went round and arrested uh, Chris because they went to the Cheltenham Hotel and, and found all the bomb-making equipment. And, uh, and, and they thought, well, how, how could he possibly know? So, and it, but the question I have is, uh, well, yeah, he, he eventually managed to explain that it wasn't him, but you've got to start explaining, well, how did he know about this bomb-making equipment? Well, he seemed to be able to tap into the fact that these Irish bombers were physically doing the preparation. They, the, the universal mind knew they had the, all this bomb-making equipment and when he tapped into this field, this is the symbolism he got back from uh, the subconscious mind. Jung calls the people helping there the, the numinous, and I'll come to that a little bit later, that the numinous obviously fed Chris Robinson this information. He's, they they kind of thought, okay, we've got, got, got someone here who's bothered to try and speak with us and he's given us a thousand symbols, so we'll just give him these symbols and for what they mean. Amazing guy, Chris. Um, I spent uh, a lot of time chatting with him, interviewing him, and um, he, he went on from that. And uh, where, where, do I, where do I start next? He was, uh, he was uh, flown to um, Phoenix, Arizona, to be tested by a chap called uh, Professor... Um, Oh. I remember the name, I'm sorry about that. He's a professor of uh, all sorts of ologies in, in the University of, uh, <laughs> of, of, of Arizona. And he's, he's been testing mediums and things like that. And they, he tested him, um, Gary Schwartz, that's his name, Professor Gary Schwartz. He wrote an incredible book called The Afterlife Experiments. Um, and he, he flew uh, Chris over there and tested him on his ability to dream what he was going to see the next day. And the way he did this was uh, uh, Chris would wake up in the morning, write down his dream, and then, uh, without seeing what the dream was, 
the, the professor would ring a friend in California who would ring another friend who had 20 envelopes. And in those 20 envelopes, uh, there were destinations that Gary was going to take to take, take, uh, take Chris to that day. So he never knew where he was going, and there were 20 envelopes, and they were only doing the test for 10 days. And one, the guy would pick one of the 10 envelopes, send it to his other friend in California. That person would then relay that information back to, to, to Professor Schwartz, and then he, Professor Schwartz knew he had a target to go to that day. And he filmed the, the journey in the car with, with, with uh, Chris. And, and you, you can find it somewhere. And 10 days out of 10, Chris was 100% spot on. Okay, but that's not the shocking part. <laughs> this happened in August, and in the middle of it, he had a dream of the Twin Towers and the planes hitting the Twin Towers. No. He recorded it, the video stamp on the video, I've seen it. This was a month before the Twin Towers. So you think, how could he know this? How could all this happen? Well, the universal consciousness was aware of all the potentials and all the things that could happen, and that's how he got the advanced information. When the first tower was hit, he got a phone call, and on the phone it just had a series of zeros. It was a U.S. general, and the guy, Chris, was trying to tell the U.S. general, said, but sir, did you, are you aware of what I was doing in... in um, in Arizona with Professor Schwartz and, and the guy said we were appraised on a daily basis. <laughs> He's since been working with the, the, the crazies in, in, in the, um, and, and I got to know him through Carol because Carol was also uh, involved with things like that and, and, and Chris does some amazing, He's, he was on an incre incredible Japanese show, they used to fly him over there and he would find missing persons live you know and, and, or missing bodies. But it's, it's, it's a, how does he know where he's going to be taken the next day? How, how can we foresee the future? And it's about the actual ability to see what's in the minds of other people and the probability of that. And so the short-term probability is pretty good. I have the email transcripts he sent to MI5 the day before 7-7. He was right on all four places and they knew about that attack in advance. That's how bad we are in this world, that, that, that some of these people are absolute devils. So he can see and predict. This is pr probability in the short term. The further ahead, the probability dies off. So then I ask yourself, well, okay, if, if I can now understand how short-term prophecy works, what, what's the deal with long-term prophecy? How can you predict something thousands of years ahead? The only answer to that is when you look at the, the cycles and the rhythms in the universe that the mind of God will know. If there is regular cyclic things happening, it can begin to predict similar events happening in the world that happened last time. So if you've got a long-term prophecy and people and humans have experienced the effects of something happening 12,000 years ago, then it's possible to tap into those memories. Heck, our souls probably got memories. Our ancestors, our higher selves. There's a lot of beings and minds and ways that we work which haven't even, we can't even contemplate yet. If you look, if you talked about reading Jane Roberts's book with, with Seth, Seth talked about a character who is his higher self called Seth too. And he is, has concepts and concept, com communications with Seth too that he can't even understand because Seth too lives in an environment that's too difficult to understand. So our, our own ability to understand our environment is difficult enough. We haven't even begun to try and know the questions to understand these other environments. We're not ready for that. And yet, every single being on all these matter frequency worlds right here now is going through this same 12,000 cyclic event as the solar system passes through this galactic current sheet. Somewhere, somewhere along the line, there is a memory of what happened last time. It may or not be quite the same, but it's a, it, there's at least something that's going to be given to us in prophecy. Now, the thing about prophecy is, and what, what Jung tells us a lot about, is that there's a necessary ambiguity 
within prophecy. There are interpretations that you get which are subtly different as each person looks at it. There are nuances which we begin to, to grasp uh, only when we start working together with this. Uh, when, when people are incredibly creative, they tap into a vein of inspiration. Uh, musicians can produce amazing works of art that go on to be incredible hits. And then they, they get the rather embarrassing question, now oh, that must have taken you a while. Actually, no, it took me about 30 seconds to, be able to get that one up. And suddenly they, they, had the, they had the tune, they had the words, and, and it, it was just massive. It just all carried on after that. They hit a vein of creativity, and they got the download. And when a painter does this, or when a writer does this, you get downloads. You never quite know what you're going to write. And suddenly you get spun off on one. And you might think you know what it means. When you're painting something, you might think you know what it means. And it will have a personal message to you, perhaps. But there's a time when you, you have to also recognize that actually you know that information is coming through for not just you. It's for other people to look at. And that triggers their minds and their subconscious mind to download further information. It's one of the beautiful things about Jung and the Red Book. But did I mention Jung was a prophet? Shock horror. Unbelievable. And they don't talk about that in the Jungian analyst school, I can promise you. <laughs> so one big bone of contention. In fact, he, he, poor old Jung had a, a bit of a, a falling out with his Jungian community, but he had to sort of keep that persona so that his whole, whole system of psychoanalytical work was still done because it was benefiting so many people. But he'd moved from being an orthodox Christian to being a Gnostic, someone who, who studied uh, the Cathars, uh, someone who actually paid a lot of his own money to help the transcripts of the uh, Nag Hammadi Gospels to be translated so that he could find out what these early Gnostic text texts were all about. But when you read Jung's words, when he discovered that he actually had predicted World War I, he struggled within himself because he didn't have that science to understand it. He said, it's not right to be able to know the future, you know. I forget the actual words, it's, it's not good to know, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but this was just one thing. Um, I, I love Jung's work, it's just, it's just got so much in it. Um, and, and then, you know, I, you probably know I've written some books about the grail and, and grail energies and things like that. Did you know that Jung was following the Holy Grail? His wife spent 30 years writing about the Holy Grail. He had dreams of the Holy Grail. He was, a, he was a knight with a red cross on his back. <laughs> you just can't make it up. He had dreams, uh, uh, even in the Red Book, he thought he was Percival in Wolfram's uh, pa Parseval, and he was, he was actually getting visions about how he, was, how he was Parseval. Then he looked around and saw every one of us was Parseval. And actually, he was doing something which was quite relevant because he, it was about purification. We'll come to that in a bit more. So Jung, and I'm going to quote some things from Jung about prophecies. So this long-term cyclic prophecy is now important if we have a regular cyclic event, and we have one right now. This is the galactic currency. So the question about prophecy, it's all very well, but you've got to know when. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a bit late for prophecy. <laughs> Well, what was that prophecy? Oh, that was an event. You missed it. <laughs> so, um, and, and how, how did I get onto this, which is, which is, because I wasn't, I wasn't really planning to look at prophecies, um, <laughs> until <laughs> we, we, we started realizing that the, um, the fourth emperor dragon that arrived, uh, basically, um, because all the lines widened, we had to look where it was. And, and it was the strangest of things because when we eventually found it, it ran from the North Pole to the South Pole, like a meridian. I call the lines running north to south are meridians. Uh, interestingly, there are 144 type four meridians around the world, every 2.5 degrees around. And they, they almost certainly will have used those as part of navigation in the early days. But this, this one emperor goes from North Pole to the South Pole. And it, it actually runs down through the east coast of America, down through South America. It runs through what was an incredibly powerful ancient first order node at the Temple of Viracocha at Raki. 
uh, and that's where the, where the first order node was last time. It's not there now. Um, but it, it, these meridians have an interesting feature in Earth energies as they don't node. So there's a very powerful meridian that runs through uh, a type 4 meridian, but there's two or three type 4 meridians across this country. But does anyone know Sina Dunhill? Yes. 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 Cool. That that's where the Michael and Mary line meets in Oxfordshire, yes. <coughs> and that has uh, two type fours meridians either side of it. It has. It, they don't node. That's the interesting thing. They don't node with the actual node that the, the Michael and Mary line meets. It's it's, it's up near Witten clumps, and and and, and they're, they're about a hundred meters either side of it. So it has a protective nature to it. <coughs> Whenever I say something in, in, in Earth Energies, don't take my word for, for being granted. It's a snapshot in time. So when I say they don't node, that's right now. They could, they could come together later. <laughs> Especially if I'm working with you two. <laughs> other people and other minds and all sorts of things starts happening. They are dynamic energies, these things. You never quite know what. And it's actually important to not know. I, I, years ago, I used to have a training node in Bath, and I used to take people to... <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell that story. The training node would, would, would keep me on my toes, and for the, for the people coming back for, for, for second and third level courses, I would take them to this node to basically find out where the energy line centers were and to repair the node. So I'd teach them how to move the lines to repair the node. And I would check this place out, even the day before the, of the session. All fine, all fine. I'd come back to it, and it got to the point where I was now worried what would happen. <laughs> Every time I took an, a group there, the node was in a different sort of position. The lines were all over the place. And I could not think in, in any way that it was fixed. It was like I was being tested just as much as the others were being tested. So you, you, you have to keep on... on uh, being not fixed in, in your mind. You have to be prepared. So it's a bit like Aikido, when, the, when, when the, the, uh, you, you say something to your teacher to begin with, it's onigai tashimash, which is please teach me. Yeah. The master, the teacher, says the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Please teach me. So it, the, the, we are absolutely beholden to these energy lines, the serpent lines. This, this is the universal symbol of the serpent, all in cultures, all around the world. They are the energy lines, the serpents. The serpent in the Garden of Eden in the Gnostic Gospels or was around around the tree of knowledge, the tree of knife, the tree of life, the axis mundi, axis of the mound. And the, te the Gnostic Gospels talk about the serpent as being the instructor, the teacher. Go figure. <coughs> yeah. So we can't, we can't actually be saying, okay, the meridians are definite. They may well join up in that last moment. So... Um, this north and south line thing, this, this, this Emperor Five Dragon, um, it was a bit surprising, but then as, as, as sort of synchronicity starts popping in, uh, the prophecies start appearing when you need to have that information. And I was made aware of the Hopi uh, Indians, uh, Blue Kachina uh, star prophecy. And... Um, they talk about uh, when, the two, when the twins arrive. Uh, I, I, I hope you don't mind that I've got one or two things I'll read because I don't want to misquote things. Uh, the twins, uh, Pogan Hoya and Palonga Hoya, one was, they're both the god of the North Pole and they're god of the South Pole. And one of them's even the god of echoes or god of sound. And the, 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 the actual... Uh, statement it says from the beginning of the appearance of the twins it is said there will be a period of seven years for all life to adapt and prepare seven years well the twins arrived in december 2017 i know you're all doing your maths now <laughs> it's december 2024 so what does that mean if these are the twins which looks like they are because the elders have said they've seen the blue star and, and they've had it seen it in the dreams. So the, 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 the twins have arrived. We're in this seven-year zone. Now, the, 
the critical question if you have is, like, okay, so there's a galactic current sheet. When are we passing through it? How do we know when we start? And Ben Davis from Suspicious Observers seems to think it's back in the 1950s that it all began. I think it's probably December 2017. There's another uh, a, a wonderful book, hardly, well, hardly known at all, um, by, by Wolfgang uh, Johann von Goethe. Uh, Goethe, you know, for Faust and, and uh, things like that. But he, he wrote a fairy tale called Das Marchant. And this fairy tale is, is another title. It's called the, the Beautiful Lily and the Green Serpent. Or the Green Serpent and the Beautiful Lily. If you go onto my website, on, 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 on that, if you click on books and the Green Serpent and the Beautiful Lily, scroll down, there's a sound cloud, and you can listen to it. The actual uh, translation of, of, of this thing. The reason for mentioning this is because uh, Steiner spent nearly half his life trying to understand. If you know about Steiner, and he said, it, Steiner felt that Goethe was the one philosopher that actually came anywhere close to trying to understand Steiner's world, what's going on in his head. So you remember this kid's got a, he grew up with the fact he was seeing all sorts of uh, elementals and things, nature spirits and divas. And, and he was searching for a philosophy of science or something that could ex help him explain his own uh, actual bona fide observations. And, and Goethe was the one that only came close. And so he studied Goethe massively. It's why he called uh, his big place in, 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 in Germany the Goetheanum. It was in homage of, of Goethe. But the, the green snake and the beautiful lily was something that Steiner spent years trying to understand and, and admitted he didn't manage to in the end. And, the, and, 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 and again with Jung, you know, these, these were great people. They just had one unfortunate situation is they didn't have any understanding of, of geobiology. They hadn't got an understanding of the energy lines because it was hardly been talked about. Yet Steiner did talk about streams and forces. He knew about the Michael stream. He knew about the, the, the solar, the Sibylline streams. And so he, he was aware. And I know he did talks up in North Wales and he would walk up to the stone circles up there. So he was aware of it, but hadn't seen the picture. Now in the green snake and the beautiful lily, when you look at it from a geological perspective and you see the symbolism of when the serpent, for instance, puts his tail in the mouth and, 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 and that Ouroboros has a huge symbolism for, for a node. You then talk about the, the, the one character in the story that knows when this final event is going to happen. And that is the permanent bridge between the land of the senses and the land of the spirit. This is where we're at now. We're in the land of the senses and we're talking about the worlds of spirit. And this permanent bridge. And, and the story is all about how people go across from one side to the other. You've got your ferryman that takes you across the water, just like when you die, you, you get your, your soul taken across the world of spirit. You've got the, the, the giant, the sleeping giant, and that's basically it. Uh, in the morning and the evening, you can cross over. That's like in your lucid, lucid moments. And then you've got the green serpent. And you can go over the, 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 the abyss, the, the river between the worlds, by going across on the green serpent. But everyone's waiting for the permanent bridge, when the two-way traffic for everyone can go from one land of the senses to the land of the spirit. And the final part of, of the... Of, of the uh, of the whole journey in, in this short fairy story is that permanent bridge being built. And the only character that knows when is the green serpent. And, and the, the lily, who's symbolic of the vortexes, the beautiful lily, basically uh, there's this phrase that when it, it, they all want to know, is that when is it happening? And, and, the, and the beautiful lily says, oh, it's, it's, it's happening, it's coming, coming, but I need to hear the time is at hand three times in one day. The time is at hand comes from Revelations in the Bible. Revelations is another universal prophecy. If you start looking at that in the last few pages, and by the way, if you ever read the Bible, forget all of the Bibles and just go to the Vulgate Bible, the original Latin 4th century Bible, look at it up online. That is, and if you can read Latin, it's even better than the bastardized English translation they give you. <laughs> Okay, because everything else stems is another retranslation from the original. And you start reading the original Latin, you think, whoa, that's not what we taught at school. Did you know the Tree of Life was mentioned in Revelations? Spanning the river? Anyway, the time is at hand.
for the new Jerusalem to come down. This is the whole system that we're in. So the, the universal prophecy in, the, in, the, in Goethe's green, te- green, green Snake was revolving around when the green snake herself knew when this was going to happen. That's kind of like saying, well, the Earth energy lines are what's going to tell you when this is going to happen. Because they know, and the reason they know is because it's connected to this long-term cyclic prophecy of these energies coming in from the eucalyptic currency. So when these come through, the, neutri- the, the cosmic energies hit our atmosphere, converts to neutrinos, smacks straight through into the center of the core, gets transduced, sending out these big, uh, very, very low vibrational uh, waves, which we now know as the emperor dragons. And there are six emperor dragons. We think there's probably six sources around around the, the galaxy, uh, around the outside sources, the Pleiades, Arcturus, or things like that. They're sources of energy. It's possibly why people think uh, that, that aliens come from the Pleiades and, and Arcturians and things like that. I just think that's a source energy coming from that place. But when it comes down into the Earth, where they cross over and you have these nodes and these portals, if you go to a, a, a particular node that's, that's been uh, presented from, uh, say, the, the, the Sirius energies, that's where you're going to meet the Sirius, the, the people from Sirius. They're not aliens from off planet. They're just beings on different worlds within the same area we have, but on a different frequency. So if you go to a portal, you can tune straight into them. You get the sense they're from Sirius because the source of the energy was from Sirius. So I don't believe in these extraterrestrials. They're all intraterrestrials. They're in, they're in and around us all the time. The question is, which ones are the goodies and which ones are the baddies? And, and you can bet through the media and Hollywood, we're being told the wrong information. Giants are bad. Yeah, really? Maybe they're the good guys. So anyway, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk, you know, have to kill the giant. Anyway, so what we're looking at here as he tries to find out where he, where he wrote anything, <laughs> uh, is the, the serpent in the green snake was the one thing that began to give us the advance warning of when this galactic sheet is happening. So our energy lines widening was a first sign that something's different, that, that perhaps this is the beginning of the transition zone, that, that the current sheet is now... I mean, we've got some scientific understanding for differences on the planets uh, that, that are happening, but when is the actual point of the prophecy we need to know that and what's going to happen so um, the next thing that started being changing on on the prophecy on 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 the energy lines was the harmony time that we had quarterly it was like well it was only about half a day long and it was on that day before the solstices and the equinoxes and then uh, Tim and I and a few others found that it didn't stop one day again in 2017 and the harmony period stretched to one and a half days and then up it went up to three days then six days last time it's 15 days long and what i mean by that is that all the energies were just one frequency Uh, and when we first started measuring it all the the bigger lines started to 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 go faster and move quicker from side to side to come into harmony with the with the with the frequencies of the energies of the what type type ones and type two lines but more recently now, every single line from its side to side movement has slowed down so much that it's now in frequency with the 72 hour frequency uh, Emperor Dragon that came down last, the sixth one. It's like everything is now being overpowered by the presence of this new source energy, probably the sen- energy from the galactic center of our galaxy. It's overpowering. If you only have one noise, one vibration, it just completely breaks, breaks through everything else. That's the, that's the kind of p- property that this inner core of ours, as a transducer, it overrides everything. When it gets a huge amount of en- energy, it like muffles out all the other fri- vibrations, and we're just going to get one. If you extrapolate this uh, harmony time out to continually growing, at the December 24, you find that harmony time is going to be about 96 days long. If you work it out. <laughs> If you work it out, it actually means that all year round. So when we get that pulse of energy, just like the type three lines, when the Earth goes through the heliospheric current sheet, oh, did I just mention the sun? Yeah. <laughs> the, the Earth 
only runs through for two minutes every eight to ten days but when it does it gets a jolt of electricity that, that makes all the type 3 lines move in at harmony just those lines and that because it's connected to the sun we're going to get that jolt when we hit the galactic current sheet and it's going to override everything and we're going to have one frequency non-stop I don't think that's going to change much I don't think there's going to be calamities or, or catastrophes because we don't get that on the harmony times but what we do get is a sudden stability in frequency, which we don't have. When we, when we, uh, a, a, a friend of mine, James, who's a guitarist, we, 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 he, he basically used something called an Ebo to, on, on his guitar to try and prolong the sound, which we were, we were tuning to the uh, harmonics of an energy line in Bath when we were doing a seminar there. And, and when we got it right, and it's so difficult to get it right, everything vibrates every cell in your body it's like everything in the room feels like vibrating and we just looked at each other and thought what the heck is going on <laughs> it was just shocking and 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 uh th the point being was the next day he played it same note no changes and he had a tinny flat noise nothing happened because that moment had gone yeah. Yeah. That's it. and the, tri the tricky thing has been all the way up to now has been we actually have difficulty connecting in a sonic way the way we, we try to do if you try and hit the right note singing so you have that the, 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 the higher note singers and the lower note singers and the, together when we get it right intuitively there's an overtone and that overtone is what sets the resonance off that's what we strive for and when we get it we feel it we suddenly go deeper in our meditation it's the most amazing feeling in, in, in group meditation when it happens but from december 24 we're going to find out that this fundamental frequency that's emanating from the center of the earth will be stable. So tuning any instruments to it, knowing what voices and sounds to chant will become easier. That now gives us a chance to learn and develop and to go on to the next stage. I don't think we're being rushed. You know, God isn't some kind of sick joke person. You know, he doesn't want to wipe us all out. Well, Perhaps not all of us, but he, he, he is giving us time to prepare. He, he, look, that's where you're going to jump off that high meter board. You're going to surf that 30 meter wave. Sorry, 30 feet wave. I don't want to scare you. <laughs> you know, I, 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 took, I had I, a lot of people have this, by the way. It's not just me. But when I was a kid, I had reoccurring dreams of riding a huge wave. Yeah. I mean, I, I absolutely can't tell you. It happens very regularly. And there wasn't any fear, just wasn't sure what the hell I was doing. So maybe there's, a, maybe there's some message in that. So we're looking at uh, this wave is coming through. And he's showing us, look, it's going to be a big wave, but you're going to be able to handle it because you're going to be taken through in stages. Uh, and the, the question that's now on people's minds is, okay, if it's happening in 2024, December 2024, what are we going to expect to see and find and hear? If you look at the mechanics of a galactic current sheet, uh, and again, this is, you don't tend to hear this in normal science because this comes from the electric universe theory and, and relativity theory can't handle that. In fact, relativity theory can't really handle anything anymore. <laughs> so the, 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 the inside the galactic current sheet, just like you find in the heliospheric current sheet around the sun, there is a reversal zone. It goes from the plasma goes from positive to negative when we pass when that reversal zone passes through the earth you'll probably find that connects with quite quite some dramatic physical changes on the earth i suspect since it happens every 12,000 years it's not life-threatening we may get weather patterns changing that could mean that summers become winters and jet streams flow in different ways so there's going to be changes physically but there are some people who will tell you well that's when you've got a tsunami that wipes across the whole land the earth stands still the sun moves over the place yeah okay well there's a lot of geological features that i'm aware of that are in the the low 100 feet level close to sea level but if you had any large movement of water across you know delicate arches that have stood for 50, 70, 100,000 years. Things that balancing in very, very precarious positions 
you know, for, for thousands of years, any big sheet of water would completely wipe all of that out. You wouldn't have evidence for delicate geological formations. So I don't, I don't think we're seeing anything dramatic in that sense. And, and not all the time, by the way, when you have a, uh, every 12,000 years, we don't see evidence for magnetic reversals in the geological history. When you, when you actually drill down into rocks and you measure their paleomagnetism, you can see whether it was a North Pole up the top or a North Pole was where the South Pole was. You can see that going back thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. So every 12,000 years, we might just get the North Pole moving halfway to the South Pole and then changing its mind and going back. That's just a magnetic incursion. That's not going to be too, too, too much. We just, we just go through the effects of a lower magnetic field, more cosmic energy. Cosmic energy is massively mutational. As I said yesterday, it, it follows evolutionary periods. And we take leap forward, leaps forward. Uh, there's, there's, there's a particular time zone which I, I'm fairly certain they're saying that the human, human's ability to, to create art in Paleolithic sense became prolific at those points when when uh, um, there was an evolutionary period with high levels of beryllium-14 in, in isotope ratios. Um, yeah, anyway, so the, the question is, when is this reversal zone coming? And if it's 200 years to go through the galactic current sheet, it's probably going to be in the middle. So we're looking at, this is, this is, this is probably, and I don't know exactly, but around 2050, 2060, is when we're going to get that part of the, the, the uh, galactic current sheet. At this point, I want to mention something about Rudolf Steiner. He knew when he was giving his lectures, he was telling people what was going to happen, and he knew it wasn't going to happen in his lifetime or their lifetime. He knew, and he would tell his audience, that he was priming them for when they were coming back again. He knew that much. He, he wanted to get in, information into the souls of, of his mind, of the minds of his audience, that this is what you're going to be coming back for to help people with. I mention that because we may be all in that same boat, not doing this for us, but preparing for people to come, our children, maybe even our, our grandchildren. And that's an important aspect. We may not witness the main event, but we're definitely in it for the start. And, and that's partly this whole business about forming groups, learning about meditation. And that's where if we, if we get the groups and get people understanding what we, what we have to start trying to find out by December 24, we're going to be on a really steep learning curve at that point, And we really are going to find out what we need to do. So that, that's uh, a little bit about uh, prophecies and long-term cyclic prophecies and when we think this might happen. Um, but. I've just talked about the long-term prophecy, and I've talked about short-term prophecy. We have a point where the long-term prophecy moves into the short-term. That is something which becomes important for us. And, and that now means we have to become prophets. We've got to be able to pick up information in the collective so that we get this advanced knowledge of what's about to happen. So we can share and change what we're doing and, and apply differences. And it's going to affect everybody differently in the, in the world because there will be some fireworks with the sun. If you've read my newsletters, the lowering magnetic field is almost certainly going to mean we're going to get an X-class solar flare facing to the Earth that's going to wipe out our electromagnetic grid. So it'll be tough for three months for anyone on the Earth-facing side of it. We just won't have any electricity probably be a good thing for half the people but it'll get fixed but we have to have food for three months we have to be able to, to, to survive without going crazy and help other people survive without going crazy so that's probably our biggest threat as I see it in the next 50 years a low magnetic field earth facing solar flare so uh, we become short-term profits how do we do that and that's about connecting to the subconscious just like I was telling you about Chris Robinson having preset information, preset symbolism that allows us to uh, understand the information we get given. All of that is something we've got to get a lot better at. And that's part of preparing. So, um, 
At this point, there's a few extra things we have to tell you in the prophecies. <laughs> How long have I got, by the way? Ten. 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 Okay, so <laughs> let, let, let me just read some of the, these things here for you. Uh, Jung, uh, when he drew uh, one of his images, uh, drew this picture of the sun with fantastic red and orange rays coming out. Underneath the sun is this uh, man in sitting, uh, sitting in meditation on a flying carpet with holding an urn above his head which touches the sun. They've, they've, they've kind of said it's like a World War I prophecy, but it's nothing like that. So, the sun of martyrdom pouring out its bloody rays, its rays grow, big, grow brighter. Twelve times strokes of the world clock, the twelfth hour is complete. He was getting glimpses of something happening with the sun. Yeah, another another uh, image that comes to him is, is resulted in him saying this. They recognize the oneness in agonizing pleasure. That's when everything becomes one. My heart is filled with wild battle, all leading to a union with all humanity where the veils between all the worlds come down. He, he was getting information about a particular event. I did actually uh, have old prophecies. That I mentioned about the Hopi Indian Blue, Blue Kachina prophecy. Uh, here's some things which uh, they said. Many of the gateways that once protected us will be open. Things unseen will be felt strongly. When the veils of the world come down, we'll be able to see the beings on the other world because they're still in the same space. But now that we're all sharing the same frequency, we're going to be able to see them. Our realities will shift in and out of dream state and it'll be hard to make sense of things. Doorways to the lower worlds will open and all living beings will be present. And then another one, the purification. They talk about the big purification that's coming. Will come from the form of a red sun that will also be seen in the night sky. A great, great red light from the star will shine on all of us and it will change the manner of our being. Everyone and every being will then have the opportunity to awaken and evolve if they are living by the original teachings and following the natural ways. This is that Hopi Indian prophecy. The Quero Indians from Peru, they talk about a gateway opening and a very special ray of light from the sun appearing at the time of Mass Day when the gateways will be opening again. Uh, they talk about a ceremony that will bring down high frequency light energy. And it'll bring in a new age where mankind will simultaneously reach what's called the fifth level of consciousness. They call it a great spiritual awakening called the Taripe Pacha. And interestingly, it's described as refinding ourselves. Have a think about what refinding ourselves might mean. <laughs> like our higher selves, our families, all of that. That's, pre that's pretty shocking. That, that's, they're quite old ones, but I want to just... I, I'm always slightly worried about what I'm going to say next because it's, <laughs> uh, uh, um, I mean, it was just immense for me when I first came across this, that, 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 that if you're hearing this for the first time, I'm sorry. If, you, if you've come across this person before and you know, you'll know what I mean. Because uh, to give you an example, uh, Einstein said, the whole world bows down towards me, but I bow to the master. And that chap's name was a philosopher called Peter Dunoff. Who knows Dunoff? Not many. Oh, God. <laughs> the most prolific Bulgarian writer today died in 1944. I came across his work following the bloody Emperor Dragons again. <laughs> they, they run up through Bulgaria. The one runs from Spain up through Bulgaria, uh, through uh, near the mountains in, in a place called Rila. And there's a kidney lake up, up there in the mountains. And uh, every year, uh, Peter Junoff would take his group and he, 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 he did something extra from Eurythmy. He turned it into pan Eurythmy and, and created something called the Universal White Brotherhood. They're called the White Brotherhood because they all dress in white. And they go in circles up in the mountains for over two or three weeks. And they dance in circles. It's only where the bloody Emperor Dragon runs. I, I mean, he must have sensed it. And, and they have thousands of people going there. So who was Peter Dunoff? That, that, that's just a huge, huge subject. But he was a spiritual writer, philosopher. But just before he died in 1944, he had a great vision. 
and I need to read you just some bits of it. This immense wave comes from cosmic space and will inundate the entire Earth. Although the inhabitants of this planet do not all find themselves at the same degree of evolution, the new wave will be felt by each one of us. This transformation will touch the ensemble of the entire cosmos. Everybody will soon be subjugated to divine fire that will purify and prepare them in regards to the new era. Mankind will raise themselves to a superior degree of consciousness indispensable to their entrance to the new life. That is what one understands by ascension. This is the sad bit. All those that attempt to oppose it will be carried off and transferred elsewhere. It, it's, in the, it's in the prophecies. It's the great separation. People will be recycled and come back and do this whole 12,000 year cycle process again. All through the yugas and things like that, just, just to experience the, the, the times in all the different constellations and the different energetic feelings that we'll go through. So there will be people here that will be experiencing this for the first time. I suspect that all of us have been here 12,000 years ago going through it for the first time. The one thing that mankind can do now is to elevate, elevate their vibratory level to find themselves in harmony with the powerful wave that will soon submerge them. We've got to roll with this wave. Well, we're surfing a, did I say a hundred foot wave? <laughs> Probably bigger. Just go with it. Don't have any fear. We've worked at it. We know how to surf. Um, little things about what we can, we can expect from Steiner now. Steiner was a prophet. He probably knew that. He, he, he actually wrote about the epochs. And interestingly, he talked about the first in epoch was the time of the Rishis in, in the early in, in Indian histories. And this was the first epoch after the, what he called the Atlantean event, when there's the last time we had 200 years of golden age. By the way, if you think 200 years is short, and time is mainly a perception, we may actually be feeling, because he talks about, in the yugas, people talk about reaching the ages of 500 years, 700 years. Even characters in the Bible, like Abraham, was said to live 700, 800 years. We may well be moving into an environment with our linear time changing. It may seem like time is flashing by, but we may be living to two, three hundred years ourselves. Um, that is very possible, you know. You know, some of us are getting younger. So, <laughs> just, 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 just spend the time on the energies. It does the raging. That's what the Grail property is about rejuvenation. You, you, you stand on the Grail, you get younger. It's like the Grail legend. If you watch the films, they get that bit right. You know, the knight that's uh, 7,000 years old or something. So, uh, so he was talking about the first epoch. Can you imagine coming out of that group consciousness into individual consciousness? How scary that must have been to not be able to connect with your ancestors because the gateways were closing. And now we're going from the, through other epochs where the individual consciousness arose, the rise of the divine feminine, then the fall of that, the rise of the divine masculine, well, sort of divine masculine. <laughs> and, 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 and now we're coming back to group consciousness where we've got to get that back into balance. And so, uh, so uh, I want to just add lastly here, towards the end of the fifth epoch, we must moot in turn become conscious of a higher form of community founded in the freedom of love amongst mankind as a breath of magic that we breathe in our working groups. The most highly cultured will not only feel pain in the next epoch, such as is caused today by the sight of poverty, suffering and misery in the world, but individuals will be experiencing the suffering of another human being as, a be as their own suffering. Empathy is really going to increase. We're going to see people who are hungry and feel that hunger. We're going to see people who are afraid and feel that fear. If, if we see a hungry person, right down to the physical, it's indeed that the hunger of that other person will, will be unendurable to us. That is where we're entering. We cannot see the sights without the feelings. And uh, I know people already who are, who are getting this, this empathy building. It's not nice, it's not easy, and you won't be able to... One, one of the things we've kind of like begun to recognize 
is that in this group consciousness phase, it's not going to be like the Borg on Star Trek, you know, where, where everyone has the same thoughts. We, we will still retain our individuality. It's our ability to how we decide. And Steiner talks about actually finding our spiritual self. This epoch was about finding our consciousness self. So finding our spiritual self, we're beginning to think that decisions can only be made when we are heart-centered enough to be able to step act back and out of group consciousness so that we can help others. So that whole concept of being heart-centered, as opposed to being just sucked up with the whole thing, we need a different way of making decisions, and that's through heart-based heart based decision making. So the mind is going to move from here down to here. So that is the goal for the next for the sixth epoch, and that's what we've got to practice. One of the, one of the things we've got to practice. Uh, there are loads of universal prophecies. We come across more and more, but day by day, and they're giving us snippets of information that we need to learn about. And, and the coming discussion groups that I'm, I'm setting up which I've been testing at the moment, will give you a chance of having group discussions on all of these with a view to, to seeing what you can actually pick up. Because every one of you has this ability to contribute something unique and vital. And we need to retain what we've learned from individual consciousness and take it through with us into group consciousness. And that's our challenge. Heart-centeredness, because if we have to have that experience to go forward. So... As for what I haven't touched on, probably what they're going to try and do to stop us or to help us reach the intensity that we need to reach. Yep, they're probably going to try and stick more vaccine in us. They're going to lock us down. They don't want us to travel. They don't want, they're probably going to shut the internet down at some point. They won't want us to form groups. And they won't want us having any money. So they take all of that away from us. We've got to accept that. But we've got to reach that point where we don't need to be together. We can, oh, it's seven o'clock Tuesday, we can connect wherever we are. And suddenly we're connecting to the same meditation group because we're back in Spain or we're back in, in Peru where we've been with our groups. And we can be that and live that and we can begin to work to telepathically and communicate with each other. So we don't need, and we're not there now, but we can get there. And they can't stop that. And they can't stop the effects of people coming together in a heart-centered, resonant way because that spreads. And that's, that's, that's where we're heading. So, I've got a few minutes for questions, I'll try that. But yes. Uh, at the moment, they're the ones who are playing devil's advocate, the, the, the most powerful, wealthy people in the world. Uh, I think they're infected demonically, but you, you can't think of good and evil as opposites. You've got to think of them as two aspects of the same thing. It's like people who are, ha have a lot of heart-centeredness in it. You could, you could probably measure it by the amount of photons you can emit from the heart. These people probably can't even emit one photon. It's just on the scale of things. They're just, they're not, it's, there's no light and dark. There's just an absence of photons. <laughs> so you're, you're talking about, uh, yeah, you probably know it's easy to be corrupted when there's money. So the wealthiest people in the world are all part of that. Any other questions? Yeah, if we're all, if we've been all affected by the energy, they must be as well. Yeah. So does that mean that that will work towards de decreasing their power? Well, un unfortunately, uh, they're also uh, very much corrupted by fear. And, and when you have a lot of uh, ego, or you, you, when you have a lot of fear, you build your ego up to, to, to suppress that fear. Uh, and one of the problems that they've got right now is that they are so switched in on social media, they are able to pick up on all the things that we're doing now and how much we don't listen to them. And there's more and more people who are now not being programmed, not listening to them, and they're worried absolutely massively. And that's increasing their levels of fear. And because of that, they're ratcheting up their response to that. So they're not going to actually be the next on the list to, 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 to suddenly find God, if you like. <laughs> There's a bit of a way to go for them. And as I said, they may be as part of the separation. There's some lovely pictures by, drawn by Bruegel and, and, and uh, Hieronymus Bosch depicting the great separation, by the way. If you, if you go back to the few newsletters on that, and you can see how he's, he's drawn the elementals and, 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 and the uh, angels uh, uh, basically separating out the people who are ascending and, and, and stopping the people who are not ascending. 
A lot of these wonderful works of art in the past are containing huge hidden messages, which of course the church will corrupt and, and, and sing their own songs with. Any, any other questions? Yeah, you were talking about meditating on these nodes, <coughs> yeah. um, and there's a network that you're running. Is there any way that we can do it? I'm not running it yet, and I'm not going to run it when I have it. It's, 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 it's <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to let it go, okay? Yeah. Uh, but the idea, is, it, it's called a sacred network, it'll be on the blockchain, it's half finished at the moment, we've got to test it. It will have sites on it, it'll have more and more sacred sites put up there. Anyone can join, it's free. Anyone can put up an event, if you want to have it online or on-site meditation, you can put up an event, you can uh, join events, you can join groups, you can start groups. There's discussion forums, you can join others and you can contribute. And uh, some of it won't work, some of it will, but w the idea is that the, the groups form locally mm -hmm. around sacred sites, but the, there's an interconnectivity across the world and across the country between groups. So for instance, if someone in, in Peru gets this message that they think is really important, mm -hmm. they suddenly find with a, uh, with a special search, wow, I've got uh, 50,000 people around the world with the same message, with the same symbols. Mm -hmm. And that sort of sends like alarm bells in the human community thinking, ooh, maybe we better look up on that one and, and check that out. So, but it, I'm hoping three or four months' time it'll be ready. But where we all fit this in, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> <laughs> any, any more? Time for one more question, Kim? Have you got uh, a meditation planned for summer solstice this year? I, I'm going to Oliver's Castle yeah. on the Monday. Uh, I'll be there from 12, but we start at midday. Uh, th 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 this does raise an important problem, though, and one of the reasons this website was sorted. There are some wonderful sacred sites that really can't handle big numbers. Mm. Even up at the Tor in Glastonbury Tor, it doesn't really work with 100 people up there. I mean, 20 is probably max. The site is designed to, so you can actually set up a series of meditations. So you don't have to be there just for one hour at 12 o'clock. You could, you could book in one at two o'clock. And, and it's, it, with pr proper site management locally, and that's one of the reasons I don't put up some of the sacred sites is, for instance, there's, there's a, an, a beautiful first order node in, in Japan. It's being run. It's in Kyoto. It's being run and organized by the people that own it. It can't cope. It, the actual island it's on is not accessible anyway. You, you can't have 100,000 people all trying to go there. So the, the locals have to manage it. And that's not up to me. It's not up to me to suddenly just put the site up saying this is the most incredible place in the world and everyone's trying to get there at the same time that's nuts in fact we don't need to be on this big site all the time just once with a working group so get a group that works well together then do your pilgrimage to a really powerful sacred site take that energies at that point you will replicate that same power anywhere because they're learning centers they break through the barriers once you've broken through that barrier at that site you have it for the rest of the time there's another thing about the community, which is about sharing frequencies as well. But we've now found all, all frequencies and we're sharing them. Just meditating with someone who's ha who has all those frequencies, you'll pick those frequencies up. Anyway, sorry. Do I, am I out of time or I've got a chance for one more? Eli? Ah. One more, okay. At the back. Yeah, is there a particular date on December 2024? <laughs> I'm guessing if I had to guess it's the, it's the solstice because that's when the harmony starts so it'll be the 20th or the 21st yeah so but, but it, it yeah I mean it, it, we have to start before then I, I actually have a bit of a problem leading up to the solstice of the 2024 because if I'm teaching people to douse for earth energies I need to teach you how to find these different energy lines and they all have different frequencies it's remarkably difficult to teach people the different frequencies when there's a harmony time. <laughs> so when I set up my, my, my dowsing courses, I can't do it on the harmony times. So I'll have less time to do that in the future. Oh. Quickly, your dowsing courses, is it, are they on your website? or do they I haven't put any up yet, but they will be. It, it's, it's just a logistic nightmare at the moment. For, not nightmare, but whatever. Well, planning anything in the future is going to get harder. I should yeah. mention that. It, 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 you know, the, the just-in-time game has begun. Yeah. Do you remember when we left Spain? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just in time. Just in time. 
I took, I took this, this group into Spain a, a couple of years ago now. And literally, we woke up in the morning and I knew I had to get everyone out the hotel at 7 to get to the airport. Something about 7, we had to leave at 7. Yeah. And to the point then, uh, there was a query on the bill. Yeah, I'll just pay it, you know. <laughs> we'll sort it out later. Yeah. And, and, and uh, Stephanie was saying, I think I might stay. You coming, you know. <laughs> you're not staying, you're coming. <laughs> literally, we, we, we drove out of Tatana. We'd heard actually that... By, from the receptionist that they just tested positive cases in Tatana's nightclub that night before. As we drove out of the town at the roundabout, the police were putting up a roadblock. They looked at us as we drove by at, at five past seven, and one was, a, one was about to raise up his hand to stop us. He put it up, and then he watched his hand go back down. <laughs> They, 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 they were locked down for weeks after that. that and we, we, we could have been in that hotel for weeks. So how we got out in time, no idea. But it, it's about being just in time now. So, yeah, I, I, I thank you two for that, yeah. You weren't late. Uh, sorry, thank you very much for that today. Thank you.